Welcome everyone to the May 2023 Tauga Group Quarterly Investor Webinar. Today we'll hear a presentation from Tauga's Managing Director Mark Thompson about the group's recent updates. Following Mark's presentation, there will be a Q&A. Thank you to everyone who has submitted a question ahead of time. You can also submit a question during the presentation through the Q&A function on Zoom. We've received quite a few questions, so if we don't get to your question, feel free to get in contact with us after the webinar at info at I now welcome Mark Thompson, Managing Director of Talga Group. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Alex, and hello everyone in whatever time zone you are in. Welcome to our, um, we're trying to, you know, one a quarter to catch up on the, the past events. Um, slight delay in this one uh, due to my extensive travels over the last month, but uh, here we are willing to be with you and uh, answer. I'll, I'll, I'll obviously might touch on a lot of questions uh, during the during the, the, the webcast with our slides, um, in which that may be another reason we don't answer a specific question at the end is it's already incorporated into the presentation, uh, but I'll be trying to allow uh, for a really good amount of time. So please, please do contribute and uh, ask anything you want um, during the webinar. We'll get to it if we can. Um, the usual disclaimer for these sorts of things, just to refresh for those of you who are either new to Telga Group or interested in becoming a shareholder, we predominantly make battery materials and we're developing a supply chain that's based on our 100% owned resources and very clean um, technologies up in Europe. I guess we get asked quite a lot about what's the difference to us versus some of our peers on the ASX and the TSX. Um, we're at an advanced stage of a vertically integrated project. So that's the mine, the processing tech and the actual anode uh, refining itself. So we actually make fully coated active anode material uh, already from a, from a demonstration scale plant in Sweden. Um, and we're, in the, we're not far away from uh, getting, getting to create, um, create the actual project itself with um, construction, I would say, over the next 12 months. Um, our emissions profile is very much lower um, than anyone else, uh, pretty much, um, especially on a like-for-like -like basis, but predominantly over the existing supply chain. We have a lot of our expertise is in-house, so the um, intellectual property and our know-how is predominantly within Telgo itself. It's not usually contracted in front of the companies. We don't license anything from anyone. And we're located in Europe entirely from the, the mineral source and the processing um, and we've also got other products that are coming up that are currently, I guess, are not necessarily valued within the company, like the silicon anode product, which is um, a very exciting addition amongst others, like conductive additives and the graphene products, of course, which are, are all still progressing actually behind the scenes really, really well. Um, so anyway, just, a, just an intro to what the heck we are about. So if you're not interested in batteries and cleaner materials, we're not really the company for you. We actually make real stuff and that's quite a rare and difficult thing in the modern world, but we believe it's of great value. Our, our mission is to essentially clean up what our existing supply chains and provide innovative technologies and materials to for other people, our customers, to make better quality products. And by quality, we mean not just in performance, but, but in the actual emissions profile of those things. And that's built through our DNA. Um, it's not like a, a recent uh, statement. It's been 10 years of this is the reason why we exist. <laughs> ultimately is, is trying to make a difference. So I think a lot of our shareholders share that. Um, speaking of shareholders, um, we have uh, over 12,000 now. Uh, I'm still the second largest shareholder. Um, we have a, a range of really quality Australian and UK institutions. Uh, you'll notice that some of our other shareholders that have been with us for nearly 10 years now are still with us and continue to participate in investments in Talga and uh, um, really yeah, just just very, very proud of everyone's support for, for our mission and, and, and the quality of our assets and the quality of our people and what we're doing. Uh, recently, of course, the markets have been uh, absolutely terrible. Um, so our market cap shrunk down to 460, but we've actually got 50 million in cash over the last quarter. Uh, after 13 years of being listed, this will be our 13th year of listing. Uh, we've got 360 million shares on issue. Um, and you, know, you can all argue amongst ourselves about, about the markets and shorting and all that sort of stuff, but that's not really my place uh, here right now. Today, I'm going to go through what we've been achieving and what's coming up. Our operations globally, uh, people often ask, why are we in Australia? Well, we started in Australia, and actually, it turns out the ASX is actually a pretty good place to be over time. 
for developing green uh, and strategic and critical mineral projects around the world. Um, we have now opened a uh, corporate office in Europe in Stockholm, uh, in addition to our site offices in Lilia and Kirina, where the operations are. Germany and Rudolstadt continues to play a significant role, mostly on silicon at the moment, uh, but it still plays a significant role on processing IP and, and scale up of technologies. Our battery center of excellence in Cambridge has been expanding. Uh, it's been awesome there, what's coming out there from our team. Uh, and our Australian office um, is also involved with offices in Japan and Hong Kong, where we have sort of trading, trading houses and product development using certain technologies that we then transfer back over to Europe. So let's just talk about our first project because the company isn't the project. The project is within the company and it's one of many projects. But uh, our, our stage one of our Vitangiano project is an integrated uh, operation to make 19,500 tonnes per annum of anode. Uh, this is, that's the equivalent to about 16 gigawatt hours of lithium ion batteries. It's to be based on refining in Lulio, uh, it's, which is an industrial park that's, that's being developed by the local government. Uh, and that has road and rail access directly to our customers throughout mainland Europe. Um, and that's fed from uh, concentrate from our Batangi graphite mine that we're developing, uh, which is up near the existing mining operations of Kirana and Svapavara and uh, Kanasvara. And we have other graphite uh, uh, deposits through that area. But Batangi is the first one we, we're looking at developing and that's the most advanced. The whole operation up there runs on hydropower um, there is wind, there is some nuclear further south in the country as well. There's a proper grid. And this uh, our green credentials not only get audited by automotive OEMs when they come to visit us, uh, but they actually go and audit the electricity companies themselves too and check on that supply. It's been quite a thorough process on that. But it's a, yeah, it's a significantly low cost and green uh, part of, of our processing. Uh, let's look at some recent milestones. So first of all, the um, down at the refinery, with uh, we're building with the first customer in the um, Herzfeld Industrial Park. We'll be alongside groups like H2 Green Steel, LQRB, SSRB, and others who are moving into that area. But we are the first, so we've cleared the land and uh, things are getting prepared there. We do have a building permit already achieved back in late March. Uh, there were no appeals uh, from that process. And we're now going through the environmental, which is sort of like an operational uh, permit, which is con we conducted successfully uh, early this month. And we're expecting the decision from that court at the end of next month or 21st of June to be specific. Um, we've made an application to commence early works. Um, that means that if anything is, um, if there's any sorts of appeals or any um, if there's any delays of any sort, uh, the, the court can actually grant us the ability to still commence early works. And uh, either way, we would expect to be able to start construction on the site later on this year. Uh, that can be fed from our existing graphite ore stockpiles. So there's some flexibility in what's happening up at the, the mine site because we do have um, total concentrators that can come down to our existing purification facility and, and feed this plant to produce material for, for customers um, for, for quite a while. Um, let's see how this goes. Up at the mine, up at Vitangi itself, um, obviously everyone's been focused on the mine, although I think the anode refinery is, is very significant as far as that's the first thing we can actually operate and, and produce material from, and, and the mine uh, has some flexibility and timing. But importantly, uh, we have been granted an environmental and Natura 2000 permit for the mine and the concentrator. And it's probably a little bit underrated that what, what that involved. The permits that we were granted is for the mining and processing of 120,000 tonnes per annum of graphite ore up to 2070. Uh, it included all of the uh, details and conditions and permission to store waste rock and tailings on site and how to re remediate things uh, with, along with our mine closure plan and also any water treatment and discharges as well. So it, it wasn't as simple as, it, it, there's a huge amount of work that was done uh, by a staff and, and, and consultants to, to pull that together and to go through what has been a, about a three year process, um, which is now concluded positively. The court found in a very extensive, you know, nearly 200 page uh, judgment that uh, the, the mining operation could go ahead 
under these conditions and it could coexist with local stakeholders in various ways. And so it was a combination of a lot of work. And uh, again, it goes back to when we talked about permitting this project, everyone said, well, you won't be able to, this is a major risk. Well, there's, we're still going through a statutory sort of appeals process, which is part of the, the, the legislation that's how it works up there. Um, and that will be decided. The next uh, announcement on that will be around 14th of June. We're expecting the, the court to talk about whether they will a allow appeals or not and, and what, what how they will handle those appeals that they've received. Um, right now, we don't know what the content of those are or if any uh, will actually be allowed or processed at all or, or what they'll decide to do. So we'll, we'll find out then. Um, but it's it's been a massive, you know, the court has already approved it. And now it's got to go through its statutory process at the, the back end of that. And uh, that's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And I think it's it's still uh, as a greenfields project with a new mineral fitting in with a new process technology and uh, uh, part of a, essentially a new industry that fits the Green Deal within Europe. You know, it's a very significant um, milestone for us that we, we gain that permit. Uh, here's a bit of a bit of a screenshot actually from <laughs> actually I took this over the over the uh, shoulder of one of our, our uh, mining engineers when I was last there. It's a draft plan of our underground development. Um, the, the existing Jork mineral resource we've upgraded successfully. Every time we've drilled for Tangi, we just grow its size. It's it's there's a large uh, uh, exploration target there, which is you know very clearly defined. It's up to 200 million tons. We've uh, drilled less than 12, 25% of that strike of that exploration target at the moment, and that's developed just under 37 million tonnes at 23% graphite, at quite a high grade cutoff of 11%. So it's basically on a, on a high grade or not in this deposit. It's a very singular sort of big sheet that goes for 15 kilometres around a giant dome. It can grow much, much larger. At these grades, of course, it contains a lot of graphite, and the graphite is 100% the small flake that can be turned into battery anodes. So it's more of an anode mine than a graphite mine, if that makes sense. And this is a key difference as well with others. We don't have this vast range of different flake sizes to do. It's 100% material that can go into batteries and that's what we've proven. Uh, we're interested in expanding over time. Um, we have customers with very large uh, roadmaps of, of demand. Um, so we've got a range of technical and economic feasibility studies on how to go Underground, we do have designs in for pits as well, but the underground obviously would minimise surface impacts and over life of mine, we see OPEXs. I think the scoping study we published several years ago showed that the life of mine OPEX was about the same, actually. And this is how they currently mine the iron ore in the area and uh, things like that. So, uh, yeah, we're heading towards, there's an existing plan for over 100,000 tonnes of anode per year that we are continuing to advance and um, we're a bit, Bit excited about the potential, how to do that faster, how to do it better, how to do it cleaner, how to make it fit into all the things we've been learning in the last few years, and also how to make it potentially um, much larger, depending on all the constraints that we have to study. So it's a very, very active and exciting area for us at the moment. Recently, uh, the situation in Europe continues to just power on, frankly. You've got a lot of recent policy initiatives like the Critical Raw Materials Act, of course, that only came out a couple of months ago, but also that was followed by the Net Zero Industry Act. And importantly, the White House came out and announced uh, a um, sort of compact or an expansion of the IRA into Europe. So it's not exactly clear what that is yet, but it's it's extremely uh, pleasing. We've been exploring green funding opportunities, um, particularly the upcoming sovereignty fund and other things that will be um, that, are, that are looking at getting developed within within that stage, whether they make it for our stage one financing or, or not is unclear at the moment. But obviously, there's a big uh, incentive for us to try and include that uh, in our financing going forward. Uh, the US, interestingly, is meeting in Sweden as we speak. Uh, well, not right now, this hour. Actually, in about eight hours, um, the, the the Secretary of State and some other. Uh, there's a very, very high level of interest from America into Sweden and um, and into Europe. So the strategic side of these critical minerals is sort of coming to the fore. And this, as, as someone that can build projects that processes material and uh, turns them into critical things like battery materials, uh, this is 
seem to be uh, uh, very good opportunities for, for us going forward, more than there has been in the past. But it's relatively recent. It takes time. And our profile has been growing. We're now recognised as uh, you know, one of the key players in reducing the need for Asian imports into, into Europe and for dropping the CO2 emissions of the current materials. Uh, on the financing side, uh, very exciting times for us. We'll be doing a lot of work on this behind the scenes. There's very little that we can talk to, but essentially we're one of the first graphite owner projects in the world that's capable of achieving um, you know, what we'd say commercial commercial debt. Um, so that's what we've been working on. The ERB is appraising uh, the project very closely and coming to the end of their process, I would say. The European Investment Bank is a, is a very quality first mover. Uh, we're hoping that they will cornerstone the lending consortium of leading banks and credit agencies that would build a certain amount of uh, a majority of the project finance will come from come from debt um, and try and decrease the amounts of, of equity and other financing type of options that we have for the rest of the, the balance. Um, we're actually expecting to get uh, credit approval from this consortium. Uh, probably in spits and spurts, but basically all of it should be out over the next quarter. And behind the scenes, uh, the team, to their credit, just churning and working with a bunch of independent groups to provide technical and environmental reporting, anode and graph up market reports, uh, financial and legal um, for all these financiers. Telgas had to provide a lot of this and uh, work through the details with with all these um, debt financiers. It's a much higher hurdle to 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 break than maybe going to a a customer who wants to take a chunk of the project, but obviously it frees you up to, shall we say, maximise your opportunities going forward. You're not, you're not totally stuck with, um, you're not um, sterilising some of your potential, shall we say. Sound is not so good. Uh, off takes. Uh, yep, everyone's. Uh, uh, we currently currently continuing to progress our off takes with ACC and Vertical that have been announced. Um, for a certain percentage of our uh, material. We're also continuing to advance dozens and dozens of other battery makers and OEMs as well. Um, and the uh, I'll speak to this probably in question time about the, the, you know, the delays or why hasn't this been done, but I can tell you at the moment everything's still progressing. Um, but it's very exciting to work with these large groups. It's not easy to work with large groups, especially on agreements that are at a bank debt financeable sort of quality versus a sort of raw material offtake. It's, it's a much higher level of uh, commitment and, and uh, quality that needs to be done. Uh, on the anode market itself, um, you know, pretty recessionary year in lots of ways. So there's been a big blip in the market in the first quarter in particular. So you've seen prices and uh, getting hammered from both EVs and, and then the battery supply chain. Uh, this is, there's also been changes in the Chinese subsidies, a lot more flexibility in graphite than there is in lithium. Lithium is such a small market that it fluctuates you know, very widely. In graphite, there's been more material that's been available to transfer over from the steel market or somewhere else in the supply chain to bring over. Not enough to fully do it, but it's relatively imbalanced. So there hasn't been the same sort of price increases. We think this is going to clear over the next few months as um, the debt ceiling in the US and a few other things, interest rates and everything else sort of Finish, finish their rises. And as you can see on this uh, Macquarie Research uh, graph up here about the deficit starting ar around now, it's, it's sort of emerging. Um, you still have most of the supply chain going through China to be processed. All the Japanese, Korean materials, most materials anywhere in the world are all, are all like getting processed, being purified or shaped in China, even if they're coated somewhere else. So I think the real number, this is benchmarks data and uh, um, yeah, in, in, from yeah, from my understanding, I would actually probably put the Chinese uh, input on our production as higher than that. Depends on where you put the cutoff on the materials, uh, purification, shaping part versus coating part down down line. Anyway, the bottom line is that there's a clear strategic driver for non uh, for, for, for for like Talga resources somewhere else in the world to be developed, both not not just from the raw material, the graphite flake side which especially on the smaller materials will, will go, are expected to be a severe deficit um, over the next few years, which is around the timing when we come into the market and, and head into production. And at the same time, um, this global push to rebalance the supply chains and have them outside China. So it's still a, fan, you know, still a fundamentally sound situation to be in right now. Just a little bit on silicon. Uh, it's very hard to show you any 
anything about it. There's uh, there's patents going through and a lot of uh, a lot of tech and know-how. But the pilot plant's going really well. We're really excited about what it's producing. We're really excited about the customers we're working with and the demand we're getting. We actually, a couple of days ago, we were at the European Battery Show and we just swamped with uh, even more customers. And what's happening is they're sort of swapping in between. They, they might start with telling OT, they want some silicon or they approach with silicon and they have some C or conductive additives. So they're all often moving around. But what our product is, is a mixture of graphite and graphene we make from our own materials. So when we're making the anodes, any byproducts, anything that, that uh, isn't to spec or anything, we can basically go away, smash the heck out of it into materials that we then make into a composite particle of silicon, which we buy in, and we make a 50%. Uh, our primary core product is a 50% silicon containing particle. It's got energy densities up around 1800 milliamp hours per gram, sometimes higher. Um, it's actually quite tricky to then dilute it a little bit lower, uh, but it depends on the customer what they want. Mostly they don't want that energy density, not for EVs, like they want but for drones and other things that that's fine, but uh, it's very exciting depending on the, the life, the lifetime. This stuff cycled through, we've had tests over 500 cycles. Um, it's designed to be basically a, a boosting additive. So you don't make the whole anode, we just make this high energy material, they'll take it away and they'll sprinkle it in, mix it, blend it into their existing other anode graphite to actually make the energy density they want. By the time you look at the price of that, so, so silicon uh, anode is more expensive, but if you get the price down to where we have got this very large scale commercial opportunity with a, a practical way of making this material, then there's there's a way that on an energy density basis, that cost can be lower on a, on a dollars per kilowatt hour basis. Uh, we're also doing some really exciting work. There's a little bit of this um, over in the UK is... So the, the, our Cambridge lab is, is working under the Faraday uh, Institute funding, working on recycled battery graphite. Now, that's testing not just scrap from production of batteries, but it, black mass that's been in used batteries. And we're getting samples in from around the world, and we're separating that. Now, commercially, no one's been able to make that work, again, in, graph in batteries. Um, by itself, but we have a no, we have a some of our processing skills and technology in the particle uh, in this sort of nano particle area. We're we're working to see if we can use that in the silicon anode product as well. So that would give you an additional feedstock. Uh, customers love it. They love recycling programs, and of course, silicon's going places as well as a minor but growing part of the overall anode supply chain. So yeah, it's. Um, We'll talk about it more when we can publish um, some studies and customers and details about what, but it, we're all excited about it. And it's getting fast tracked through customer demand. It wasn't something we wanted to do right now while we're busy, obviously, with the rest of the Batangi project in, in Sweden. This is scaling up right now in Germany, but the customer demand is, is there and it would be foolish not to um, allocate some resources to advancing it while we can. So overall, uh, this is all increasing our operational readiness. It's very important that you have essentially a consistent shift from concept. You know, we've come from the lab all the way to the, the, the anode refinery, which people have seen at Lilio, the EVA plant, the electric vehicle anode plant operating, and that's expanding uh, in, its, um, in its hours and, and the people and what we're doing there. We're now implementing lean quality management. Uh, we're using the funding that we got from the last capital raise earlier this year to buy uh, larger scale equipment and things we need and do the detailed engineering for the commercial refinery. Uh, we're increasing our IP strength as well. But so, but in, together amongst this is the yeah everything on quality control delivery. Uh, materials involved with that is all increasing, and the, I've just come back actually from a very high quality uh, production plant and anode. Uh, supplier, should we say, somewhere in Asia, that is um, of the highest quality and it's been very inspirational to carry that technology over and, and some of the um, implement some of the things we've learnt over there and from the existing producers of the highest quality materials into our Swedish plant and that's um, continuing to grow. So yeah, this is what you have to do rather than just making a plan. This is, this is all getting ready to go into commercial production as uh, things progress. So upcoming milestones, uh, the mine environmental permit, obviously uh, people are keeping an eye for it's a big one scheduled for 14th of June um, is when essentially the environmental court will announce how they're going to deal with and treat the, uh, uh, the people that have said they wish to appeal, they haven't appealed yet. 
um, but they're saying they wish to and the court's going to grant them leave to or not and, and announce what they'll do with any if they accept the appeals to be heard. Um, down at the refinery, similar process, uh, decision on the main environmental permit 21st of June, then it will have its own uh, uh, period for, for appeals. But down there, obviously, it's a, it's a refinery in, a, in, a, uh, in an industrial site. So it's quite a different uh, kettle of fish that shares a lot of common um, uh, issues or things to be dealt with, but uh, it seems to be a slightly shorter time frame. Uh, the project, the debt financing is is really it's going to be significant, probably for larger institutional investors as well, potential project partners, uh, other commercial banks will. You'll see certain groups that if they go to a credit approval on this project, it really means that they you know their diligence has been uh, put to rest, should we say, um, their diligence is very high and it will have a, a strong effect on um, our ability to not only finance the rest of the Utengi project, but other projects as well within Europe and continue to grow uh, the company globally. Uh, excited about, as I said, about Silicon, um, where the customer agreements can get to in supporting, uh, pushing the button on commercial development and all the plans behind that. And of course, we are still uh, doing some, we're quite excited about the things, you know, we've had a few years since we first put in the NISCA exploitation permit. And as we've been through the recent permitting with Vitangi, it gives us the ability to think more carefully. And we've got a lot more data on how we could go about the NISCA expansion as well to fit in with customer roadmaps and beyond uh, much larger as well. So timing wise, I think I've done an okay job in uh, to within two minutes of my target for finishing the slides. And now we can go into the Q&A with you all. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you for the presentation and updating everyone on the group's activities. So as uh, Mark says, we're now gonna to move to the Q&A portion of the session. Uh, once again, thanks to everyone who submitted a question ahead of time or through the Q&A function on Zoom. So first question, Mark. Um, how will the EU's proposed Green Deal recycling targets impact Talga and natural graphite? I think that at the moment, the as far as we can tell, the the burden for the recycling is falling on the, the cell makers or other people in the supply chain. It's not on the raw material or even the advanced chemical providers. Um, I think the way you should think about Recycle graphite with Talga is when you think about what we what we've built and what we own is our processing tech and the, the tech we have in our production line is there are there are innovations in it and there are some unique things that we do and when you think about our background in things like nanomaterials like graphene we we're quite good at uh, manipulating things at small scale and the ability to maybe play a role in taking in black mass and recycling the graphite into something is probably, there's a higher possibility that we can have a business opportunity from that than, than maybe others. Uh, the graphite currently, as I think I said earlier, is commercially, it's not, no one's really shown any viability for doing it back into batteries. Uh, scrap metal, scrap production is, is pretty easy because the graphite hasn't been lithiated. It's so uh, when you make batteries in the, you get the foils, like they're trimming off the edges that material has got very pure material on it. It's never been lithium, it's never been used. If you scrape that off and recover that, you can probably use that in batteries again, but it's it's relatively, uh, it's not in significant volumes, but it is, it is insignificant on the scale of things. So the used battery materials, people are getting the lithium out and the copper and whatever else and the nickel, they haven't been able to do anything with the graphite. So I think it's a significant opportunity for us commercially, we'll have to see. It's got a, you've also got to meet CO2 targets on it in, in the processing. But if we can crack it where others can't, and we're providing that service to customers like cell makers in Sweden or throughout Europe, that uh, obviously will be legally bound by these rules around recycling, then it grows the opportunity for us even further. And that, that's a global opportunity for us. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the way we're going about it. I think we've got the right, um, the right skill set and technologies to do something about it if it's, if it's going to be feasible. And I don't have any qualms about it 
taking over like volumes of the market because frankly the, by the time you, you're talking about 10 years until you get some of the volumes needed for it to start impacting on the greater market so it's all um it's all going to be good thanks uh we had a, a sort of a more technical question regarding talnode si um is it the finished anodes that have 50 percent the 50 percent silicon additive or what what is the finished silicon percentage in the anode how does that work Ah, well, no, we make a 50% additive silicon anode. You can use that if you want, but you, the, the customer will tend to not want that energy density. They'll tend to want a lower energy density with different performance characteristics. So currently your, your graphite anodes are down around like 360. So your, your, your current battery's got 360 milliamp hours per gram um, energy density in the anode. So if you think about, uh, say you've got a big, uh, uh, like the equivalent of a Ford Lightning or an SUV, a truck or something, and you might want uh, 450 milliamp hours per gram, significant increase in energy density in your battery, but it would decrease cycle life by say 10%, something like that. So you've got to, they've got to do all those calculations. They work out how much of our material they want to blend into their existing supply chains or into our own uh, group, Telnode C, for example. So just to be clear, we make we make that base material is fifty percent. Every and what what it's diluted to. If they wanted to deliver it diluted for them, we can do that, or they will take it and they will blend it into whatever they want. So that's the the cell makers uh, or the auto ohms who are cell makers do that themselves. Does that answer it clearly? I th I think so. Um, another question on silicon anodes. Um, do you think silicon anode will ever replace? Uh, carbon-based anodes completely? No. Someone probably wants an explanation why now. There's yes, why? That. Yeah. The, the, well, I mean, fundamentally, while the, it's just the, the silicon expansion is, is, di, is diabolical, uh, it's just the way it is. You, you, the amount of electrons it shoves in there, it just swells too much. You can't have a pure silicon expands by three times its volume. So a battery, well, almost every battery on earth that you want to use in your, or sit your kids on, you, you don't want it to, it doesn't have the potential to change volume by 300%. So if you have a package, I mean, so, so you'd have to have some sort of jelly-like floppy thing somewhere. It could be, it's, it's just not, it's not feasible. So uh, even the, the guys that have been promoting 100% silicon in the world that we know of, they're all coming back now to towards 50% blends and, and below. And uh, it's, there's a certain ratio. So over time, it can get refined, but you get most of your bang for your buck early. So you, you get a huge energy density. The energy density, it's not linear like that. It's more like it's sort of steep like that, and then it curve flattens off. So by the time you get up to 50%, you've got about like 80% of your energy density increase anyway. So there's sort of no need to do it. And of course the cost is higher, um, whether you're using silicon, silicon dioxide, everything about it will. So essentially the more silicon, the shorter cycle life. And it, it just comes down to fitting your purpose, right? There's no one size fits all because someone's got a big car, someone's got a truck, someone's got a bus, that's different from how long the battery's got to last for in a drone or in your laptop or in your phone. So your customers have all got different aims and they will, the nice thing about Tonade SI is you can buy it at a very reasonable price, I must say, and you can trickle it. You, you can dilute it into whatever you want. You test it, you get the results you want to fit your product. You can talk to us about altering something slightly to improve it. You can change your electrolyte chemistry. Everything will change. But so that gets you most of it. And the need to go to 100% silicon is just the price, the lack of cycle life, like the longevity of the battery, unless you've got some sort of crazy aerospace uh, type type application, it's not going to be bulk, um, you know, the market that you're talking about. So no, I don't don't see it technically achievable or economically achievable or or commercially even uh, attractive to do. If you're going to go to that extreme, then you're going to try and make it entirely. You're going to try and chase some other technology down altogether, like some sort of quasi solid state or something else instead. Okay, thanks. Um, what is your take on the recent announcement by Pewdiepie and their plans to build an anode factory in Sweden? 
Yeah, it's um uh, good. I mean, we uh, what can I say? Can't say much. Um, put it this way: most most EV batteries are a blend of uh, synthetic and natural, and the current synthetic supply chain in Asia is extremely uh, high emission, and it's very non-sustainable. Any shift of that supply chain to Europe and running on hydropower, where it cleans up, and the, if the ultimate if the ultimate end result is you get a cleaner synthetic as part of a mix in a in a battery, good. That's that's fundamentally sound. From Telga's point of view, a lot of our customers are either blending uh, are blending with synthetic or want us to blend for them, and that will. Uh, to have a source of European anodes. There are others in development, but there currently hasn't been a lot available. So obviously I can't go into details of what Pewdalyze, um, you know plans are and how it can fit in with us, but it's not a, put it this way, I would suggest to you it's not a competitive situation at all for us. It doesn't threaten us. In fact, it's, an, it's, a, it's a potential benefit. Um, Pewdalyze is actually, in my view, one of the better quality companies uh, of synthetic. In, um, out of China, and I think from a skills point of view, technology point of view, um, yeah, if you if they were producing material on based on hydropower and having a lower emission synthetic, while it's still a petroleum based type background product, it's still a fossil fuel derived product, and it still sucks a lot of energy and still has high emissions. It will be lower emissions than anything getting made currently. So I I, I support it if it um, makes a difference, but. Um, but yeah, it's not, you shouldn't really see it as a competitive thing for us. It's just really a sign of the continued demand growing in Europe and the lack of local facilities coming on fast enough to supply the local cell makers. It's really just showing the maturing of the rapidly expanding um, cell making capacity over there. On the subject of synthetic anode, uh, synthetic graphite anode, but a question from the Q and A: um, Can you talk to trends surrounding synthetic and natural graphite anode products? Yeah, I've been seeing some some pretty funky press lately. Um, the trend is for more and more natural. Why? Because natural actually charges a bit faster, but mostly it's a little bit cheaper. It tends to run about ten percent under synthetic prices and or depending on your quality, but for high quality EV quality natural, which is actually very difficult, was not a historic part of the industry, um, but but groups like we make it now and to, to that quality, then you know, you're talking about 10% less price, but more importantly, much, much lower CO2. You're talking about emissions on that material of 20 to, to 30 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of anode, uh, whereas we're down around one to two tons of CO2. So it's a really, really big difference. Because the graphite is such a large volume part of the battery, so it's far away the largest volume of mineral in the battery, that CO2 hit carries all the way through the, the battery into the, the overall vehicle and its life cycle assessment when you look at the emission signature. So, um, so the trend is towards more natural if it works. Like if you can get it to work in an EV, which is a really high quality, high standard, very difficult to do, uh, to be honest, compared to lots of other battery materials. So you'll see a lot of anode pricing out there, but it's not for EV quality. It's for um, it's for scooters and other other low order sort of things. But for EVs and eight year warranties plus ten year warranties, um, it's much higher quality. So with the right natural, there's a trend to use more of it if they can. Uh, right now, it's still a minority of it, but it tends to be increasing over time. Right now, in the short term, though, you have had energy prices come down. You've had an abundance, an overcapacity of synthetic being made in China. And so you've had, uh, and you've got, frankly, what the Chinese have done previously in the graphite world, where they will dump material around as new projects are coming on to try and depress prices and capture you know, customers preferentially and stop other projects coming on. So. That, obviously, I'm very biased, but if you go back to the early 90s, you actually that's that's what you'll see happened, and you could well argue it's happening again. So I think you're going through some short-term uh, dumping of synthetic from overcapacity. Also, the steel industry um, yeah, has backed off recently as well. Again, when you have a recession, you have all these synthetic electrodes that, that can be, or material that can be, uh, you can have flexibility in that supply chain, whether it goes off to the steel industry or comes over to the battery industry. So you're, you've just seen some short-term stuff to do with synthetic um, coming off in price and things like that, but it's not sustainable and it's not sustainable for Western car makers 
that have got more and more stringent emissions legislation around their vehicles. So the trend will continue to be increasing amounts of natural over time. And that's what we've seen with our customers, of course, is they, they start with testing 30%, then add 50%, and then want to go to 75% at all. It all keeps just uh, increasing of interest. Um, bear in mind that over the last 20, 30 years, no one was making high enough quality natural that it could really be in that mix much. It was, it was relatively minor. Uh, but going forward, it's a big, big market, and it's sucking more and more of that material. Thanks, Mark. Uh, what is your take on the sodium ion battery technology and are, we co are you conducting any R&D into this technology? Yeah, sodium ion's been getting uh, yeah, a lot of press. Uh, CATL's you know, come out pretty strong about it. Um, but if you actually look at their plans, you'll see they're still very, very small. Um, sodium ion tends to have, uh, it's got a lower energy density, so it's never really been seen as viable for larger vehicles or things that might work for very, very small vehicles. Um, uh, we have done work, actually, it was about five years ago now. We did, we did a, an R&D program on sodium ion with Faradion and Jaguar Land Rover, and uh, I can't really speak to the results of that uh, in this forum, but the, we were specifically uh, looking at replacing, um, putting sodium ion into uh, sort of the, the, the electric vehicles, but not, it was sort of like in the backup batteries to replace lead acid. Uh, batteries rather than the, the main battery because the energy density is too low. So anyway, the, the technology has evolved, um, but you're still limited by just the physics of how much energy those particles carry. Sodium ion production does have some really dirty aspects to it that people haven't thought about yet for commercialization. There's some pretty uh, heavy duty chemicals and compounds that can be created in production. The supply chain hasn't really worked out yet. Uh, it's, I doubt its potential to to do much in the industry. I think it'll only ever be a minority player, but it will be a player for certain um, certain applications, but it's not going to do battle with lithium ion for uh, the bulk of EVs around the world, put it that way. Uh, for Telga, we've actually got a nice opportunity in sodium ion because I guess their point is that sodium ion doesn't use graphite anode, which is true. They tend to use more, I mean, we've, we've tried and uh, it's very difficult to get graphite to work as anodes. However, the hard carbons have actually got quite low energy density and our conductive additives and nanoscale carbon energy boosting products um, like our cathode additive uh, has got some interesting potential in that. So there's some tests and things underway for us in sodium ion um, where we can help boost the conductivity of certain parts of the battery. But yeah, I don't, it's, it's not, uh, we don't, we, we, we can't see that it's a big enough driver to throw huge resources out, but nor is it a threat to large scale graphite based anodes for lithium ion batteries purely based on uh, sodium's energy density. It's just starting to get up to the bottom end of LFP, but then LFP keeps going better again. So we'll see how it matures, but um, in reality, it's, uh, it's well worth investing in, but not, it's, not what it appears, put it that way. Thanks. Um, would you be able to give any insight on what is prolonging the customer offtake negotiations? <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky one to speak to, but uh, essentially what you've got to remember is a, a couple of main factors about the agreements that we're talking about here. So number one is that these are, these are agreements that are heavy duty, high quality agreements, very detailed that involve things like take or pay provisions and that they're, they're, they're capable of carrying some of the world's highest quality commercial banks to, to raise debt on. That's very, very different to some sort of offtake on some raw material where you just promise to deliver it at some quality in future. You know, this is, this is imminent, imminent signing up to serious uh, liabilities depending on everyone's things. So the, the quality of the agreements take, takes time. People's plans change a little bit because you don't just qualify a product for a company, you qualify it usually for a project. So, so if you've got a certain model of vehicle and the production start of that changes or so the projects that you're nominated for and working with, if they change or shuffle around a little bit in timing, that will impact on because you're part of a supply agreement for that product. Again, it's not about warehousing raw material and you're going to use it sometime in future. It, it can't work like that. You know, it's, it's much more specific to a project. So... 
Um, so in that case, sometimes there are changes uh, made in timing. And, uh, but overall things uh, progress and no change and we continue to grow the, um, the customer base and those agreements can just be impacted by any range of, of factors that are usually more you know, commercial factors of our customers or I should say more their operational factors rather than, rather than anything we're doing. But um, yeah, so it's a, it's a range of factors that can impact on those sorts of agreements and that's why you don't see so many agreements thrown around and why you don't see um, them being completed in the timeframes that were first thought by both companies to, to be achievable, but things, things uh, change in operational delivery, should we say. Thanks, Mark. Um, is Talco looking towards the 3C market? Um, yeah, we don't we don't focus on it, but we've got customers that uh, are in it. I like it because a lot of the products actually suit our product very naturally. Like we we can really outperform lots of other people's materials for some products, um, and actually because the some of the three C making uh, and for people that don't know three Cs uh, like all comms devices like laptops, phones, and uh, any devices basically that are outside uh, EVs. Um, power tools is a good market. Uh, robot, you know, vacuum planners, or things like this behind me here. <laughs> These sorts of things. Uh, all sorts of battery powered devices. Uh, so yeah, it's a different market, and it's smaller tons. And so your contracts are smaller, and they don't necessarily suit the financing of the project. But they're really nice contracts to get for for the operation like commercially because they can often be higher priced than the EV makers because EV makers drive the price down through their volume demands and their long-term commitments. And so, yeah, so we don't talk about it much because it's quite, it's it's not really necessarily part of a financing type quality package, but it's it's really nice commercially to have in the project. And uh, um, from a from a the, the pricing point of view, it's really good. So yeah. We are, but I can't be too more specific than that until various announcements are made. Thanks, Mark. Um, turning our attention to the uh, refinery, can you provide an update on the infrastructure completed to date at the Lulio Industrial Park? Yeah, I was, it's um, the sealed roads. There's uh, grid power through the front of it. Last time I was there, there was uh, you know, various ditches and water things, water drainage going off to treatment planty things going in, um, transformers, um, contracts for the power all done. Um, the lands all cleared, so the logs have all been um, sold, and uh, yeah, it's all getting ready. We're the first there, so I mean, if you if you drive past it, you won't see a lot. It's just a cleared block of land with all these you know these basics around it. But it's the first place. It's not. It's like any of these new areas for green projects throughout Europe. You know, you have to clear some land to start from scratch. So, but it's it's very. Uh, uh, all the all the basics have gone in. Last time I was there, and I guess as we get to push the button, we can. Uh, all being well and start digging foundations and eventually pouring concrete as soon as we can. But uh, all the basics are, are actually already there. Um, the other companies are separately going through their own permitting or operational process and then they'll start all filling in around us. But Talga's the first. Um, we tied that up quite a long time ago. And um, so that's why around us doesn't look too developed at the moment. But that's... Uh, no, it all looked fine last time I was there, which was only a few weeks ago. <laughs> so staying up uh, in northern Sweden, um, how will Tauga ensure it gets adequate labour for both the mine and the refinery? Hmm, interesting. Well, certainly, I mean, it's a worry when you look at the the sheer quantity of projects that are planned up in that area, the green steel projects and everything else, and look at the numbers that are bandied around on, on labour, it's quite frightening. However, and, and of course, the area's got some of the lowest unemployment in, in all of Sweden because, because of the industries uh, there that are... Um, but what we've found is that Telga's... We, we're a fairly new industry for that area, being graphite, being anode, being... Uh, having the downstream, having the, the chemical processing as well as the technology behind that, 
being a new mineral, but more importantly, the sustainability uh, sort of culture of the company and the fact that we're making battery materials directly. It's attracting people to join us from the iron and copper and other industries that are already there. So we're seen, I think, as a quite attractive employer and for our needs, for our amount of people that we are going to need. And uh, our recruiting has been quite successful. And we seem to get a really, really strong interest from um, the societies around us and the workforces in that part of, of Europe. And globally as well, people interested in coming to exciting, essentially, North Sweden, <laughs> where if you have a look at it, the quality of life is pretty good. Uh, they, they're attracted to what we're doing. It's something that people can believe in and want to have a purpose in what their work is. So, yeah, I think that's carrying us in good stead going forward. So it won't be without its challenges as we grow, but, you know, our needs aren't the same as one of these large raw material um, groups. And we, we, I think, will continue to be an attractive employer for, for a long time. Great. Um, would you be able to provide an update on Talga's graphene-related projects? Uh, Really need to do a big update for you there. We continue to, uh, over the years, since we were predominantly graphene and then we developed our first, we published our first battery results from our nano back in early 2018. So five years later, we're now, we're now funding, funding the project on the verge of development um, and are currently running you know, the only coded active anode plant um, in Europe that we know of and, and have already achieved so much in that short time. In the meantime, obviously, we had to take resources away from graphene, but we actually never stopped working with all the groups that you know of. Uh, so Bentley, Billerud, Korsnas, so many others that we've talked about, many others that we haven't, haven't necessarily published something on, but have been testing our materials. And in fact, if you look at our revenue streams in our quarterly, you'll see some, some revenue. The, most of that's from selling battery material uh, samples in qualification processes, but some of it's actually graphene revenue as well. It's not substantial yet but we have achieved uh, quite a lot in those areas. So there are customers still underway on, yep, packaging, paper packaging, cardboard, uh, coatings, the famous ship, ship coating and various other coatings um, continue um, development and work with various customers, um, additives into things like rubber and concrete continue. Uh, it's all, it's being done very, sort of carefully we don't want to have too many resources we're focusing on the big game here which is the major battery projects but rest assured that the technical side of the graphene is there now why would you even do that well even if someone else like we've proven ability we probably did things like concrete and other a lot of these things you're reading about other companies doing we already did five years ago our skills and knowledge of how to do that and our ability to commercially provide graphene when we want to at scale our processes and everything have continued getting refined behind the scenes. If someone else, like a large company, wants to proves that graphene works in their product and they're, they're ready to go to market, they want to buy hundreds of tonnes of the stuff or thousands of tonnes of it over time, you think they're not going to come to Talga and get a price and talk to us about a quote? So while everyone's still in development mode on different products, it's not so, yeah, it's not, it, it, it doesn't have the same impact on us potentially commercially as, as the battery materials can do where we can get the contracts planned to deliver into them. The most of the graphene markets aren't there yet, but we are having uh, a lot of success with most of our graphene programs technically, and we'll be there for when things commercialise. But if we kept trying to wait for these large companies to keep getting it, and what tends to happen is they test the material, discover it works great. They also then discover that that half of their existing supply chain is going to die because they don't need them anymore. There's a lot of issues with how graphene gets commercialised. But we'll be there as it does. And the graphene materials that we have got are still all advancing. And I, I, I can promise you we're going to give you an update. We're going to have to bundle it all together and to, to keep you informed. We didn't want to... We didn't want to keep it running while, we're, while we've got the main focus is on the Vertangi project. But it has been going on and when we... When it's okay to, we'll give you a big update as we can. But if you keep taking a look at Faraday and other stuff happening in the UK, you, you will see some information on it. And, uh, yeah, it continues to be available for us to take advantage of economically when the conditions are right to do so. 
All right, great. Um, so we're coming to the end of our session. So we only have time for one further question. What are the milestones over the next 12 months which you are most looking forward to? 12 months, at the end of next financial year. Uh, I'm looking forward to turning the sod, as it were, on the first, uh, on the anode refinery. I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, also breaking ground up at, up at Vitangi. I'd like to stand there and with a shovel and do the classic dig pose with local people and with our staff. Um, they're the two main things, and I'd actually like to take my my family, uh, particularly my dad. Actually, speaking of old sod, uh, which is an old old joke in our family, um, <laughs> running run, running joke. That uh, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to take him over there and show him what we've built, what we've achieved, until people visit our operations and understand more about what we've done. They can't understand what we've built, what we've achieved, and what what its potential is until you see it with your own eyes. And we've had shareholders um, visits lately along with, you know, banks and other things. And normally it's 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 really cemented their, their view or it's been surprisingly positive. It sort of changes people's views of what we've done and what we've got. And we're still very, very much under the radar in this way. We spend most of our time building things and working on things towards building them. And uh, it's... Um, yeah, we've achieved a lot and we, we hardly ever stop to recognise that. That's what I'd like to show my my family, what they've sort of suffered for for the last um, 13, 13 years and, and we will continue to suffer for in the in our mission. Um, so, yeah, bit of ground, bit of ground turning, bit of making stuff and a bit of maybe showing it off to the family and, and shareholders would be great to do. Awesome. All right, Mark, uh, that's all we have time for today. So thank you for your presentation and time answering questions. And everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, keep an eye out for the next quarterly investor webinar, which will happen in the next quarter. Um, but until then, thanks everyone for attending. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye.